today's keynote is someone I'm honored to introduce, and I want to thank her for joining us today, as well as being a little patient as we're running a little behind schedule. I was thrilled when she agreed to be this year's Peace Corps Connect uh, keynote, and she did so without hesitating. I'm talking about Sandra Clark, who is the CEO of StoryCorps and who served in Guinea-Bissau, West Africa, as an education volunteer and as a cross-cultural trainer and language consultant uh, after her service. Just as importantly, um, she, well, just to fill you in, uh, all in, anyone who's not familiar with StoryCorps, uh, StoryCorps is the award-winning storytelling organization that collects, shares, and preserves stories to deepen connections between people and illuminate the humanity and possibility in all of us, one story at a time. Since being founded in 2003, more than 600,000 people across the country have participated in StoryCorps' personal narrative interviews, many shared with millions each week on NPR, PBS, YouTube, the StoryCorps website, and other social channels. Prior to joining StoryCorps in February of 2022, Sandra was Vice President of News and Civic Dialogue for WHYY, the NPR affiliate in the Philadelphia area. She started out in journalism at the Philadelphia Inquirer, where she was managing editor and led the organization to a, two, uh, to a 2014 Pulitzer Prize in criticism. She is a longtime advocate of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and has been recognized as one of Philadelphia's most influential African-American leaders by the Philadelphia Tribune in 2021. So I just want to say thank you, Sandra Clark, for joining us, and I will pass the mic on to you. Well, thank you so much, Tiffany uh, and NPCA, and hello to the staff and RPCVs from whatever time zone you're in. Uh, it really is such an honor to be invited to share a few words, and you're in for a treat with a great panel uh, afterward. So, you know, when Tiffany called, I have to say that, yes, I said yes immediately because, you know, Peace Corps uh, remains dear uh, to my heart and has guided so much of my life. Um, you know, this is such a full circle moment for me, and you'll see what I mean about that a little bit later. So I know today's theme is serve, 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 but I have to admit that I didn't exactly plan a life of public service. My journey has been very much like Parker Palmer wrote in the book, Let Your Life Speak. He said, before you tell your life what you intend to do with it, listen to what it intends to do with you. My first example of public service was my dad, a career soldier, but as a young kid in a military family, when the military was exactly respect, respect, respected, I didn't even think of that as service. I was just a kid. I had no clue what his service meant especially as a black man also fighting for a rightful place in America. Until much later, when me and my sisters divided up his purple, purple hearts after he died. But the seed of soldiering on, making a difference was planted in me, even if I didn't know it. My career in journalism started in Philadelphia, as Tiffany said, at one of the biggest papers in the country at the time. And it was the start of my becoming a champion of people unseen and unheard, rarely asked and often not believed, both within the newsroom and in the public. And a few years in, my youthful passion began to sputter, humbled by the reality that I was a tiny dot on a big ship that turned way too slowly. It was an empty soul moment for me, one of a few that I'm gonna share today. Hmm, I was, now that I think about it, was I quiet quitting? Uh, frustrated, but still idealistic, I began to plan my escape and apply to the Peace Corps, much to my parents' dismay. And my eyes were set on <clears throat> serving in West Africa. I studied French day and night, only be assigned to be assigned to Guinea-Bissau, where Portuguese was the official language. And in the end, it hardly mattered. Almost no one spoke it anyway on the island where I served. But I showed up, my diary in hand, making copious entries from my naively clouded savior lens for the book I hoped to write one day. 
I was booted out after a bout with cancer, and I have to thank still the Peace Corps nurse who believed me. And I fought my, my way back in. I was, I was going the distance no matter what. So I returned to the U.S. six years later, staying to work on the continent after my service. And that job I escaped from, with humility and, yes, excitement, I picked up where I left off with fresh perspective about myself and service. My parents were happy again as I settled into a career of stability. But what the tug of service also does to us is let us know when we're just being and not doing. And seven years ago, I had another one of those empty soul moments. One step from the top in my company, having achieved far more than I could ever have imagined. But something big was missing. And my epiphany was that I missed working with the public up close I missed listening and partnering and figuring it out together, which meant I'd stopped learning as well. And I looked around and I thought, if I don't leave now, I'm never leaving. I left and built a community engagement division at a public media organization. So this brings me to my full circle moment and maybe why I'm here today. Uh, a year and a half ago, in the middle of the pandemic, StoryCorps came calling. Many of you know StoryCorps for its segment on NPR, but what I didn't know is that like Peace Corps, StoryCorps' mission is about creating a more just and compassionate world. It's built on a simple concept that everyone has a story and that everyone matters. As Tiffany read before, StoryCorps helps us believe in each other by illuminating the humanity and possibility in all of us, one story at a time. And I can't think of a time where StoryCorps is more needed than now. Our facilitators, what many of you know, you can, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, our facilitators, they cross the country in Airstream trailers, collecting stories from everyday people. These aren't people who wanna be famous or on reality TV, but people who come in the audio booth with a loved one whose story they wanna honor for a 40 minute conversation. And you can see our mo mobile tour schedule this year. You can also uh, do these interviews through our StoryCorps app. More than 600,000 people have participated in StoryCorps since its beginning 20 years ago, and their stories are ar archived, if they choose, at the Library of Congress, so that their families and others, 100 years from now even, can hear them tell their own stories in their own voices. And as Dave Isay, the founder of StoryCorps, wrote in his book, Callings, listening has always been at the heart of StoryCorps' mission, finding what you're meant to do with you, uh, your life has a lot to do with careful listening, listening to that quiet voice inside that speaks to who you are. So today, as we talk about service, I want to share a few stories, excerpts from those 40-minute conversations, stories filled with wisdom of everyday people, and I think stories that will give us a lot to think about. Please advance. You can see some of the people who've come into the StoryCorps booth. And again, we don't tell anyone who, what story to share. And you can see just from this grouping alone, what kinds of stories we get through StoryCorps. Advance. Okay, let's start. Lolo is my first roommate when I was a kid. So we shared a room. She would keep the light on every night because she would be up praying and the light would still be on in the morning. And I just always remember her in the kitchen making hopia, smoothing out the mung bean, making little pockets with the dough and stuffing them in pink donut boxes. And she would let me eat the duds. How did I not have like childhood diabetes? <laughs> The kitchen was always greasy and the electric bill was going up, but that was Lola's business and she never stopped working. I was told that when she was little, she was the top student, but my mom did not finish high school because my grandfather passed away early. So she did all kinds of work to support her family. And when she had her children, she had to provide for us. There was nobody else. There was no, no such thing as vacation. And when Lola got older, she lived with us, bringing up her grandchildren. Yeah. It was, I think, 2014. And you called me. 
you were caring for Lola at the time. And, and so I wanted to come home to help care for Lola because she'd always been the one who took care of all of us. Before she passed, she'd tell me stories about her life. And that's when Lola and I started painting them. You know, I think I learned from Lola that there's a difference between your job and your work. Your job is something you leave behind at the end of a day, but your work is everything you leave behind at the end of a lifetime. Lola, she didn't have the most glamorous jobs, but I think her work was all of us. It's her love for us that I remember most. It was not so much of hugging or saying I love you, but it was all the things she did. You're right. We are. We are her work. Thank you. Well, yes, um, your job and your work, there's a big difference. And I have to admit, I have seen these videos a thousand times. And these are videos that are excerpt from uh, StoryCorps interviews. And, and they make me emotional every single time. Um, this next one is a story about, you know, how we keep legacies alive and how we honor each other and how we stay connected. Uh, and two sisters, uh, you know, discovered uh, that, that their brother's legacy was being kept alive. We can play now. Hello, Mr. Atiba Mbiwan. The reason I was calling is because my sisters and I actually read about you and we have a strong feeling you may have known our brother who passed away. How did you feel about me taking on your family's name, Mbiwa? Oh, everybody was elated. Not just our family, everybody, our, our, friends. our friends. Everybody, because to know that we had someone had taken on our family name, it feels like a gift. I have to say that in my wildest dreams, I never, ever thought I would ever meet Acha's family. We met up and it was great. It just yeah. clicked. Instant click. You know, in my birth family, I'm the oldest. So Acha was like my big brother. And through my experience as a college student, he added such a different flavor of life for me. Our conversations were just rich, loving exchanges. And mm -hmm. I miss that. You know, we did talk about the fact that I would one day visit Cameroon. So we ended up making that trip together. That was just surreal for me, you know, mm -hmm. to be there. This was a whole overnight trip in that van. Bumpity, bumpity, bumpity. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> talk about bonding in a little tiny space there <laughs> with all that dust. I mean, it was kind of a fun ride, really. You fell asleep on somebody, they fell asleep on you. That's one of the happiest experiences mm -hmm. of my entire life. That was my best Christmas, yeah. So I was just wondering, what do y'all think about when you think about Archer's legacy? You! <laughs> You're very much a part of that. I mean, he was such a bright young man. And him passing away so early, that was part of the tragedy is the regret and the feeling that he could have contributed so much to this life, to this world. And then to learn that in the short time that he lived, that there was someone like you that made us feel like, okay, his impact lives on. We now are part of a family. In day one family, absolutely. Very much so. Our own brother would be just elated and in a way, you feel like he came back through you. Because now we have a brother again. Uh, 
it just shows us that uh, you know we 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 can stay connected in so many ways and and if and if I'm mute it's because I'm really trying to gather my my emotions. Um, so finally, I uh, want to share this last story. You know, we know that we don't live in a kumbaya world. We know that um, you know there's there's many heavy things that weigh on us each and every day, and uh, and yet. Uh, here, here's the wish from a Black father to his Black son in a world that we know can be difficult, but where he leaves him with much hope and aspiration. Do you remember what was going through your head when you first saw me? I remember when the doctor pulled you out, the first thing I thought was that he was being too rough with you. And he actually held you like a little Sprite bottle, and he was like, here's your baby. That was the most proud moment of my life. Don't tell your brothers, because it's three of y'all. But it was like looking at a blank canvas and just imagining what you want the painting to look like at the end, but also knowing you can't control the paint strokes you know, the fear was just, I got to bring up a black boy in Mississippi, which is a tough place to bring up kids, period. But there are statistics that say black boys born after the year 2002 have a one in three chance of going to prison. And all three of my sons were born after the year 2002. So, Dad, why do you take me to protest so much? <laughs> I think I take you for a bunch of reasons. One is that I want you to see what it looks like when people come together, but also that you understand that it's not just about people that are familiar to you, but it's about everybody. Did you know the work that Martin Luther King was doing was for everybody and it wasn't just for black people? Yes, I understand that. Yeah. So that's how you got to think. If you decide that you want to be a cab driver, then you got to be the most impactful cab driver that you can possibly be. Are you proud of me? Of course. You my man. I, I just love everything about you, period. The thing I love about you, you never give up on me. That's one of the things I will always remember by my dad. Uh, you said it like I'm on the way out of here or like I'm already to go. So, Dad, what are your dreams for me? My dream is for you to live out your dreams. It's an old proverb that talks about when children are born, children come out with their fists closed because that's where they keep all their gifts. And as you grow, your hands learn to unfold because you're learning to release your gifts to the world. And so for the rest of your life, I want to see you live with your hands unfolded. <laughs> 